welcome. Ignore the man behind the curtain. We're just setting up our speaker notes. OK. Uh, so I'm Adam Bordelon, and this is Yoris. We're both Mesos committers. Yoris is one of our most recently elected, voted in Mesos committers. Uh, we both work at Mesos here. And today we're going to talk about security, not just in Mesos, but across your entire cluster. Uh, so you've probably seen this diagram a few times before, probably several times this week even. Uh, and the key points, I mean, you know there's schedulers, masters, agents, and all that. Uh, the key points is that there are a lot of different components here. They're all talking to each other. You can have multiple different frameworks, each of them have, and you want to separate them from each other. Each framework can have its own set of distinct users, and you know, they might have their own set of permissions and access controls. Um, and you know, in a lot of cases, everything works fine, as well, long as everybody's well behaved and nobody gets in each other's way, and you all trust each other. But you know, what happens when this guy comes along? <laughs> You know, you're, uh, you're, your cluster is actually pretty vulnerable in a number of ways by default. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways that, uh, you know, you could have attackers could eavesdrop on any of the communications coming through, and they could even impersonate a, a framework or a, an agent or, um, you know, steal task infos, you know, intercept things and change them. Uh, forge communications. Uh, you could have rogue frameworks that join and start taking over your cluster resources, launch arbitrary tasks, malicious code. Uh, you could have rogue agents that uh, start you know, offering up their pretend resources and taking in your data and your tasks and you know, hosing your system that way. Uh, and then, honestly, the biggest threat that most people worry about first is just naive users that end up seeing things they shouldn't see or sh killing things that they, you know, didn't, uh, they shouldn't be able to. You know, you might think that you're killing your task when you're actually killing the entire cluster. That's, you know, you don't want to let interns have that kind of power. Uh, so today we're going to talk about a few different components. We're going to break it down into the different kind of attack surfaces. Cluster-wide security, security within Mesos, security for your framework, and then protecting your tasks. And we'll uh, touch on some of the future work that's going on and then let you drill us with questions that we hopefully know some of the answers to. Well, here are the answers. Uh, if you don't remember anything else from this talk, or you really want to rush out to that Myriad talk, uh, that's also happening right now, uh, then I hope you at least remember these five things. You know, firewall it so that you can protect the, the cluster as a whole, encrypt any communication over the wire, things on disk, uh, authentication back and forth mutually, all components, authorization, ACLs, wherever possible and task and resource isolation to you know, prevent tasks from actually affecting each other. Um, so I suppose you could leave now if you, now that you have all the answers, but uh, we'd like to provide a little bit more detail uh, on each of these. Let's so start with cluster-wide security. You gotta secure the perimeter. So, uh, you know, set up some sort of firewall, whether you're in the cloud or on-premise. You're on-premise, you already have a firewall, presumably, but that's just to keep people, only people from within your company can access it. But you might want to prevent people from within your company from, to, from accessing it as well. So firewall off your, your Mesos cluster, and um, you can let users in through a VPN so they're within the firewall, or just funnel individual uh, communications through an authenticating proxy uh, to you know, allow the web traffic and inbound requests to come through that way. Then there's all these external services that your Mesos cluster might have to talk to. Zookeeper, for one. A lot of people end up putting that within the firewall, but conceivably it could be outside of the firewall, too. Uh, you might have S3 or some other external storage where you're pulling all your artifacts from and keeping your data. 
So you're going to need to you know, connect to that as well. Configuration services, a uh, good way to make sure that each task can be different by pulling down some sort of uh, differentiating configuration. And credentials, you know, you're going to have to get those distributed around somehow. Uh, so in this kind of scenario, you're going to want to uh, you know, either have these components within your firewall or, again, open the firewall on specific ports for these specific services uh, for the outgoing and return communication. Uh, in a lot of cases, you're going to want mutual authentication. Uh, you know, for Zookeeper, for example, you would want to be able to make sure that Mesos trusts that this is an actual Zookeeper that you want it to communicate with. You don't want somebody to spin up a rogue Zookeeper and then somehow you're able to talk to it. Fortunately, Mesos has you hard code in which Zookeeper IPs you're connecting to. So that should be covered there. But then on the other hand, Zookeeper has its own set of authentication. You don't want somebody to be able to say, oh, why don't you elect me as a Mesos master? And you know, then my laptop will go ahead and know everything that's going through uh, the cluster and you know, be able to kill tasks and have all the power of the Mesos master. Uh, and you know, obviously, encryption is going to be important here as well. Uh, you want to make sure that you know, your credentials, your configuration, your data storage uh, can't be intercepted over the wire as you're going from Mesos to this external service or back. Uh, speaking of encryption, we'll get into a little bit of the security within Mesos now. And I'll hand it over to Yoris to talk about his favorite feature, SSL. So how many of you have checked out the Mesos code base and looked around in there? About half of you. All right, so there are a couple of libraries that a lot of the Mesos components use that are in common. And one of those libraries is called libprocess. And so many of the communications that occur between the scheduler, the master, and the agent, and even some of the communication through the web UI is served or happens through this libprocess library. So SSL, as Ben mentioned in his keynote, has been a long time coming. And it wasn't just as simple as turning on a switch, specifically because there are all these different communication paths. One of the um, reasons it took a little longer than you might expect is we wanted people to be able to upgrade their clusters while they're running, not just turn the entire thing down, off and you know, change some settings and then rebootstrap the entire cluster. So we wanted a, a nice live upgrade path. And we decided to put some investment into this libprocess library so that in the future, any of the communications that we want to do have the option to use this SSL library or e even another implementation. So at this point, at, with Mesos 023, it's feature complete. And it's ready for you guys to be tested. We've tested it quite a bit. Um, we are using a library called lib, lib event, and it has an open SSL implementation. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, by default, Meso ships with libev, so you'll need to be able to configure to use the lib, lib event library. It's just a way to interface with the kernel and figure out when events are ready. The SSL feature is highly configurable. Again, we like using primitives in Mesos, and so we tried to implement SSL as a primitive and let you configure whether you want to enforce it completely, allow some things to speak SSL, what ciphers you want to run, um, what protocols that you want to be able to use, et cetera. And so the, the biggest feature that I, that I like is the live upgrade support. So if you have a cluster with 10,000, 20,000 nodes, you don't need to worry about shutting them all down. Uh, if you're worried about performance around SSL, which naturally you probably should be because encryption takes some compute, uh, what you can do is you can take sections of your cluster and start rolling SSL through there. You could say take 1% of your cluster and try it out, see how it works, what, in the meantime running everything else as usual. So here's a diagram of all the different communications that Adam already mentioned. All the ones with locks on them are ones that this library 
is used for. So you can see the communication between the schedule, schedulers and the master. That uses libprocess. That's going to be encrypted through the SSL feature. Same with communication between the master and the agent, encrypted. Any endpoints that are exposed by the master or the agent, like the state.json, uh, the web UI, anything like that is served by libprocess, and so it'll support SSL out of the box. The way that you build it, I don't know if this font is a little dark, but you can see the slides later. Uh, you need to configure both libevent, which changes the underlying event system, and enable SSL. To run it, you can use the environment variables. There's one to turn on the SSL support. There are many. Um, there's a link to the, to the SSL documentation in the slides. You can go read all the different flags, but they let you choose what ciphers you want to run. By default, the only protocol that's supported is TLS 1.2. You can manually go and enable TLS 1.1, 1.0, and SSL v3. We do not allow you to turn on SSL v2. If you really feel like you want to do that, come talk to me. <laughs> the upgrade support uh, has one more flag. So that's the SSL downgrade support flag. If you're upgrading your cluster, what you're going to do is you're going to roll um, a, new, a new version to some of your machines, right? and you're gonna turn this flag on by default. What that will do is it'll allow those machines to speak SSL if you wanna to talk to them in SSL, and if they're talking to a machine that hasn't been upgraded yet, they will try SSL, see that it fails, and downgrade to raw sockets. Yeah, so, but this flag is not on by default. So what you wanna do is you wanna start that flag, enable SSL, start trying some of the machines out there. They will be talking to each other in SSL, the ones that, you have, that have it turned on, and they'll talk, talk raw sockets to everyone else. You slowly start rolling this through your cluster. Once you feel comfortable, they're already all talking to each other on SSL, but your tools, for example, if you try curling to it just over HTTP, it'll still work. The next phase, if you want to restrict it to be purely SSL and no HTTP calls will work anymore, you can do a second roll where you change this environment variable to no longer do the downgrade support. The, the reason that it, um, it, it took a little while to get this feature working is because the libprocess library makes calls out to Another, another lib process process, and then when they receive a message, they will make another bidirectional communication back. If you attended the HTTP v1 uh, API meetup thing, uh, what do you call it? session, then you'll, see, you'll have uh, heard, I think, Vinod talking about how that a, a new feature is that they'll just be able to talk over the same socket, but because we're supporting the old scheduler API for quite some time, we had to deal with this. Now the thing that we did, because we're working in C++ and we have quite a bit of access to the system, is we don't need to specify a separate port for SSL. And I think that's a really nice feature because as an admin, you can make lots of mistakes by not setting up your firewalls to open extra ports or for changing the port somewhere. None of your tools have to worry about if they're trying to speak HTTP using a different port. Um, and the way it works is if SSL is enabled, we peek at some of the first bytes. And this is really the same thing that OpenSSL does anyway. And it tries to see if it's an SSL connection. If it is, it dispatches it to OpenSSL. If it's not, it just dispatches it to the raw sockets. And we haven't popped any of the bytes. So I think this is a really cool feature and hopefully will make it a lot easier for you to upgrade your clusters. All right. So we'll be tag teaming a little bit more here. Uh, yeah, so authentication. You know, you gotta make sure people aren't doing things, you know, without your approval. So, you know, you got interns trying to run Bitcoin miners on your cluster. They thought they you know, ran this cool framework and eat up all your idle CPU because you're not really using it anyway. But, yeah, you gotta be able to prevent that. So, solution there is framework authentication. Uh, you know, basically setting a principle when you start the, the framework 
and you know, communicating those credentials so the master validates that this is an allowed framework. Uh, and any, you know, any frameworks that uh, don't authenticate are rejected and don't get to register and therefore can't launch any tasks. So that's been around since Mesos 0 0.15. Um, so it's been heavily tested. It's in use at several uh, production clusters. Another problem. Random laptops joining your cluster or you know, and stealing your tasks, stealing your data. The solution there, agent authentication. Uh, it's been around since 0 0.19, although it was known as slave authentication. Uh, and uh, so both of these use the same underlying uh, SASL mechanism. Uh, and the default, uh, default authenticators are CRAM MD5. So it's really just a user name password pair that you're sending from the authenticatee and then the authenticator has the list of all the valid username passwords and you know matches them sees if it uh, if it's valid and lets it through or it doesn't um, so we've modularized the authenticators and authenticatees in mesos uh, dot 21 so we can support custom implementations if you have uh, kerberos or Whatever else you want to work on, you can implement your own or talk to somebody like Mesosphere, see if we'll you know, implement something for you and maybe sell it to you. Um, who knows? Talk to our sales guys. Uh, so, but the, an, an important part about the, these mo modularizing the authenticators is that it means that these dependencies don't actually need to be built into Mesos. And you can you know, keep Mesos clean and simple without all these external libraries for whatever your random security system is. And we can also experiment with new behavior without having to go through the somewhat lengthy cycle of getting changes pushed into Mesos as well. So it's pretty straightforward to configure. Uh, maybe SASL can be auto-detected, and in which case you don't need to do anything differently. Uh, otherwise, you can do dash dash with SASL and point it to your SASL location. Uh, on the master, there's several flags you can, you can use. Uh, by default, we use the CRAM MD5 authenticator. Uh, if you have modules for others, uh, you, know, you use the dash dash modules flag to load those, and then you can use the dash dash authenticators to specify an alternate authenticator. Uh, in the future, we'd like to support multiple authenticators. Maybe you want to use CRAM MD5 for your frameworks and Kerberos for your uh, agents and something else for your web UI. Um, so, or maybe even just support multiple ones for each of them, because different frameworks might implement their authentication differently. And you might not have any control over that, so you'd have to support them all. Uh, the important thing for the CRAM MD5 authenticator is the dash dash credentials flag. So on the master, you're specifying a, a path to a file that holds all the uh, username password pairs. It's uh, one pair per line, and it's just a space delimited username, space password, new line, next, next. Uh, and, so, and that's a generic list for all the uh, potential credentials. So uh, the, uh, if, if you're adding HTTP users, uh, slave principle, agent principles, uh, or uh, framework principles, they can all go into that same file, and then you can use ACLs to distinguish which one can be used for which. Uh, now, if you just set this, we in, if a framework or an agent tries to authenticate, we will verify whether it's valid or not and reject it. If it doesn't try to authenticate, we'll still let it through, unless you explicitly specify dash dash authenticate for frameworks, which we really ought to alias to dash dash authenticate frameworks. Uh, and then dash dash authenticate slaves, which will apparently have to be also alias to dash dash authenticate agents. But, uh, so you know, we've got these, this is the flags you set on the master. You have to set this up at startup to you know, make sure uh, you know what your uh, security uh, policies are going to be. Uh, and you can do something similar where you, you know, allow these credentials at, but don't require them and then, you know, work on getting all of your agents and frameworks authenticating and then start requiring them. And at that point, 
no Bitcoin mining frameworks can join without your permission, and you know, nobody's random laptop can join your cluster. On the agent side, uh, you, know, you can specify a dash dash authenticate TE. Also, the defaults to CRAM MD5, but if you have a module, you would use that to specify the alternate uh, authenticate TE that communicates to the matching authenticate Tor. Uh, and then you'll specify for CRAM MD5 the dash dash credential, which is, again, just a, a file that has a single line that is the username password pair. Uh, on the framework, uh, you know, each framework may have different flags and ways of uh, conveying these, but if you're building a framework, the important things to keep in mind are when you specify the scheduler driver, there is an optional parameter called credential that you may not have noticed if you just copy pasted from somebody else's framework. Uh, so you can add that credential in, and I've got the protobuf here. It's just a required string for the principal and an optional bytes for the secret. Uh, some uh, authentication mechanisms don't use a you know, username password kind of mechanism. Uh, they may just have a principal and then some out-of-band uh, token that they're passing around and authenticating with. So that's why the secret is optional. Um, and then another little side note there, uh, the framework info that you register with can also, should use the same principal so that you can tie your authenticating principal to the authorizing principal when you're doing ACLs which leads me to authorization and ACLs. There are only a few ACLs that we currently have implemented in Mesos, but we're planning to add a whole lot more. Uh, so I'll just go through the ones that exist now, and you can tell us what your favorite ideas are for new ACLs, and file some JIRAs, and implement it yourself. Uh, or no, we'll do it too, okay. Uh, it's, uh, the first, we've got what roles can a framework register as? So roles are used for resource reservations as well as uh, fair sharing within DRF. Uh, so you might say I've got an analytics role or a system services role or maybe it's per team in your org or per user even, or you give each framework a role. So you can group frameworks within a role. Um, and you, know, you may say that you know, the Spark framework principle could register uh, under the marketing role, or the ads role, or the analytics team role, um, but cannot uh, work under the you know, sysadmin role, because you only ha allow like a certain meta frameworks or something to register under that role. And then you can also specify certain framework principles can launch tasks as individual users. So you would probably not want to allow every framework to launch tasks as root, you may want to only give them you know, certain users that they can launch. Maybe the Hadoop framework can only launch as the Hadoop user. Or maybe there's a certain set of users on a team that uh, you want to be able to have them launch tasks as you know, their users on the nodes. Uh, Mesos does not create users on the individual agents, so you're going to have to create those yourself, and then you can use this to specify which of those agent users an individual framework can run tasks as. And then we also have one uh, uh, HTTP uh, ACL. So there is a shutdown, now known as teardown endpoint. Uh, so you can go to an, the master and tear down a framework uh, just with a curl command or right there in your browser. Uh, so this uses uh, HTTP authentication, uh, HTTP basic auth. It doesn't go through the same SASL mechanism right now. Once we move to the HTTP API, all of those will be integrated into a common authentication mechanism or authentication architecture, which could have multiple authentication mechanisms. Uh, so th these users are uh, still specified with the, through the dash dash credentials. Uh, and so same kind of username password mechanism, uh, but you can say that only these HTTP users are allowed to shut down frameworks, and those would probably be your cluster admins. Uh, yeah. Um, and yeah, so we are also, mo we modularize the authorization API in .24, which is 
up for release candidate voting now. Uh, and we, I don't think we even have any other implementations at the moment, but you know, we'd like to be able to enable you guys to experiment with your different authorization backends. Maybe you need LDAP, maybe you need uh, PKI. I, there's all kinds of different options. And we want to open it up so that you can experiment and uh, implement those yourselves if you, you know, have an urgent need for it. Uh, and yes, there are clearly w way more endpoints and actions in Mesos. And you know, we're going to iteratively work on adding authorization around each of those so that we can provide more fine-grained security in your Mesos cluster. Uh, the master authorization flags. So dash dash authorizers, this is, again, just so you can specify an alternate authorizer uh, with, via a module or something that you've implemented in your own branch of Mesos. The default one is local authorizer, uh, which just pulls from this dash dash ACLs flag. Uh, and you, know, you see here you have register frameworks for which roles a particular framework principle can register as. Uh, you have run tasks for which users a particular framework principle can launch tasks as, and the and we're adding more for things like dynamic reservations and persistent volumes, maintenance primitives, all of these kinds of operator endpoints. Uh, we're going to be adding ACLs as we add these features, and going back and adding ACLs around existing endpoints as well. And. Now I'm going to hand it back over to Yoris to talk about the web UI security. So this section is called web UI security, but I think you all know that web UI is just hit at points on servers. So it's really about securing the endpoints on servers. First thing you want to do is install as many firewall rules in your network as possible. Uh, pretty obvious. We already covered it in the cluster-wide security section. Next thing, HTTPS. So now that we have SSL, try and turn it on. Uh, you're probably going to have tools that hit some of those endpoints that don't know how to speak SSL. So during that time, you're going to want to run in that downgrade support mode so that most things do speak SSL and you have the ability to speak HTTP. Once you've upgraded all your tools that are hitting these endpoints and they're able to speak SSL, then you can turn on pure SSL and, and no, one else, uh, no, no one that's not authorized will be able to connect. The, the, Endpoints themselves can be disabled in the meantime. So if there's some ones that you think you're vulnerable to, like browsing um, some of the files on the agents, you can go and disable those endpoints in the meantime using these new firewall rules that are in 023 or 024. And as Adam mentioned, you can even control the users that have access to the teardown section. So these tools are pretty coarse-grained, right? It's either you have access or you don't. And so there's a design doc that got sent out about two weeks ago to have m many more fine-grained controls around these endpoints. So please do go look at the dev list and check it out. Modules. Who, who was at the modules talk yesterday in this room? OK, awesome. So did you guys hear about anonymous modules running arbitrary code? on the master or the agent, uh, th this is a pretty big hole. And so we need to figure out what, what we're going to do with it. One of the things that I think is probably the easiest solution for now is to certify modules. So someone's going to have to go and read through them and figure out if they're malicious or not, certify the checksum, and then you can use those trusted modules. If you're running in your own environment, you probably are writing your own modules or, or using ones that are certified. So just realize that this is a really powerful tool, and the ones that you do install, you should trust. Modules, they, they use memory, they use disk, they can use whatever they want. So they can leave behind information even after whatever binary, binary they're running in stops. Right? I can write a file to disk with all your keys, all your task information, master shuts down, and you didn't even know I wrote it there. So just be careful about that. They expose all the memory to, of the master to the module. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, they, they expose all the memory of the master or the agent or wh whatever else is loading a module to that module, right? So 
if there are key, if there are encryption keys, any any kind of sensitive data that is currently being passed through there, just recognize that a module could hook in there. Watch it all stream through the system. If there's any data that you have that you think is sensitive, encrypt it yourself. So the next thing is securing your framework. Again, the frameworks, just like the schedule, uh, just like the master and just like the agent, you can enable SSL on them. You want to protect the scheduler and master, ske ske the data that's being transferred between the scheduler and the master. So that, that's done by SSL. But there's also the data that's being transmitted between your tasks. And remember, Mesos is, is a meta scheduler, right? Like we, we have no control over what your tasks end up doing. If you have Apache servers that are talking to MySQL, we're not, we're not going and intercepting that traffic and encrypting it for you. So be mindful of that. The, on, the only things that we're taking care of for you are the data that's being transmitted to operate the scheduler, which is your metadata. And you use the authorization and authentication modules. Um, for, for your framework web UIs. So the last thing you want is to have a, a framework like Marathon where you've got all these users coming in and some intern comes along and just says, oh, I'm gonna shut down this service, this service, this service, this service. And that web UI is, is built by you. So you have to make sure that if you're exposing these really powerful mechanisms that you're, you're adding the controls to them. The nice thing is because you're able to have access to um, the lib process endpoints in the process library, you can use some of the tools that we have to encrypt and, and secure this data. The last thing that I wanna mention for this is some of the uh, safety patterns. So, so uh, quite a few of the other talks, um, and I think especially Joe Smith's talk about Aurora, talked about like limits on how many things can happen in a certain amount of time. For example, how many slaves can be removed from your cluster per minute. Uh, I think even Aurora, has a, has a limit on how many things can be rescheduled. You don't just want s someone to be able to inject something into you, the packet stream or something like that that triggers an entire reschedule of your cluster. So by just implementing some of these limits, sometimes even if something gets through or goes wrong, you have time to catch it. And now I'm going to pass it back to Adam. Yeah, uh, so the last section is uh, protecting your task. Uh, you know, there's the run tasks ACL to specify what user you can run your task as. You need to also set up the on node permissions to say, you know, only these users can access this set of the file system. Uh, make sure the, the groups are set up and, and all that works however you want your permissions to work. We can't know that automatically for you. Maybe in the future we can help you manage it, but that's still a ways out. And again, you want to encrypt your data over the wire and on disk. You know, Mesos, if you're passing arbitrary data in the status updates or the task info or your framework messages, I mean, we can, we can encrypt the framework messages, but uh, conceivably, you know, any, uh, any other task might be able to, you know, read your data off disk if you didn't protect it on disk and if you didn't, you know, you might as well encrypt it to be extra safe. Uh, and then there's also, you know, the resource isolators. Uh, you, if you have your task running on a node and somebody else's task running on a node, you want the resource isolation to guarantee that their task is not going to starve yours of resources. You don't want, you know, some, you know, dev test task to be able to take down your production uh, website. So resource isolation is really important for that. Um, and oh, another interesting point, if you have to do like HIPAA compliance or something and you have some very sensitive frameworks that need stricter security models, uh, you could statically reserve a set of trusted machines uh, and assign to a particular role and assign those frameworks to that role to guarantee that um, you know, they only get scheduled there. And uh, you, know, you can still do um, fair sharing and elastic uh, um, scaling within that subset of the cluster if you want to get the improved utilization, or maybe you break it down into individual statically partitioned clusters. As much as we hate those in Mesos, sometimes they're necessary for security's sake. And there's always a trade-off of performance versus security. Um, 
And finally, we'll just touch on some of the future work that's coming up and some of the ideas we have for how to improve this. Uh, we already mentioned the HTTP authentication. Uh, so we can have uh, you know, everything going through this new HTTP API and you know, authenticate it with basic auth, Spango, you know, OAuth, all the st you know, industry standards. We want to be able to integrate with those. We can have more fine-grained ACLs. We actually only have ACLs on the master now. We need to get them on the agents as well, uh, particularly to protect you know, the sandbox access so that only the framework that launches a task can view the task sandbox. That's a bit of a gaping hole at the moment. Uh, multiple authenticators and authorizers support that. Integration with third-party security systems. Um, module certification so that you can know that these different modules you're using are approved and have been reviewed and aren't going to contain anything malicious and even check some to make sure that it's what it's the same binary that was actually certified. Uh, credential storage and distribution is another active area of, of research because your tasks might need to connect to some third party thing and you don't know where that task is going to be launched so you need to figure out how to get the credentials there either have it pull from somewhere or uh, use hooks to pass it along with the, the task data. And you know, more and more resource isolators, because even if you've got CPU memory and disk, maybe I can write something that thrashes the disk cache or uh, disk IO or network, and then can still take down your, your task. Uh, so you know, all this and more coming in a version of Mesos near you. Uh, bring it back to the takeaways. Firewall around everything. Only let people in that you trust. Uh, encrypt everything on the wire, on disk, wherever you can. Authenticate back mutually from one to the other. Uh, authorization, fine-grained, wherever we can get it. And uh, task resource isolation. So I hope even if you zoned out for the past 30 minutes, you can still just look at this slide and know what the hell you should have learned. Uh, and with that, I think we're ready to open it up to questions. Cosman. So the question is if you can have a job or a task actually authorized to do things. Um, so I mean, the important part there is just what is the principle that we can define for that task? Uh, if it's the framework principle and you can say that, well, any task launched by this framework can authorize that, that's an easy way to do it. If you want to have multiple different task principles, uh, Right now, that's going to have to use whatever out-of-band uh, credential distribution and storage mechanism. So you launch the task, and it's got a framework principle, and then that is able to, you know, based on the task user and the framework principle, go pull some other credentials to access the third-party service. Uh, yes. Yes. So. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, kind of what I was trying to get at with integration with third-party security. So, uh, the question was basically around having, uh, you know, the Mesos ACLs and perhaps even authentication and even the task ACLs able to, you know, retrieve that from some some third-party server uh, and so that Mesos doesn't have to manage all that. That's a big part of what the modules are about. So we can have an easy local implementation, but you know, most of the enterprise systems are going to have their own security services already set up, and we need to be able to you know, integrate these you know, thin module layers so that they can talk to whatever your service is. And you know, we might, uh, from a Mesosphere perspective, choose a preferred system, but Everybody's going to have their own. You know, it's same with service discovery or a lot of these systems. You can come up with like, here's one way to do it, but 
90% of the customers are going to do it some other way. Yes? I think this question is right in line with the first two, but just to be clear, earlier you were mentioning credential files in the master. Um, same thing with that. Can you kick that off to a third party? Absolutely. The, the question was about credential files in the master. Uh, yeah, the, that's for the CRAM MD5 default authenticator. Uh, so with other authenticators, you know, those credentials are going to be stored by whatever your third party uh, service is. Uh, yes, right there. So how do the frameworks and agents authenticate the master? Uh, so I mean, it basically boils down to when you start the frameworks and the agents, you either point it at a specific master, so you, that is the approved master, or you point it to Zookeeper, and Zookeeper can do the authentication against what masters are allowed to uh, you know, join the Zookeeper quorum and become elected as leaders. But you uh, can use your CA certs to verify. Yes, yes you can do that. Uh, one final question. Uh, I'm going to go over here. Um, so with the CK of authentication again, um, you were mentioning a preferred direction that you think is going to go with the server based feature lock. Do you have any preferred direction there? Preferred direction. Is it going to be cert based mutual auth or Kerberos? Um, I think that is yet to be determined. You can do. Kerberos over HTTP API with Spingo. So that's definitely an approach. We're, uh, as Mesosphere, we're looking into a bunch of different approaches and seeing what customer demand is, at least to figure out what we implement first. And I think we'll end up having to implement multiple uh, solutions. But if you want to influence that, talk to our sales and product guys and start giving us money. And you know, I'm sure we can make something happen. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Yoris and I are going to be hanging around, uh, eating lunch, doing whatever it is people are doing after this. And uh, if you have any further questions, just come grab us. Thank you.